Welcome back everybody, it's great to see you. I'm so glad you've been enjoying these videos. I've seen a lot of questions about options, options trading and strategy, and so I wanted to cover that topic today. First, let's go over a few essential trading hand signals, and these might be useful if you need to place an order while your broker is tied up on the phone, or if your internet connection goes down because of a snowstorm, you can just run right to the exchange and trade away, you don't have to worry about anything. Basically two parts. If your palms are facing in, that means you're a buyer. And I forget what the second thing is. <laughs> if your palms are facing out, you're a seller. So now that we've covered the important hand signals, let's get to two other important aspects. Number one is volatility, and the other one is option delta. I think you're really gonna love this video. It's gonna be simple, and we're gonna break everything down. If, you're, if your hand is out, you're indicating the price you want. Okay, okay, that's enough. Even though there have been lots of questions about options, you know, part of me feels like, who am I to tell you how to trade? It's not like I know all the answers. And really, I think everybody's gonna have their own different answer as to how you're supposed to invest in options. So just take this as my own perspective. And also know that I don't know everything, and just because I say something doesn't mean that it's a rule of thumb. That's not the case. These are just my thoughts. This is how I look at things. This is what I think is important. So let's get started. Okay, so right off the bat, I'm just going to tell you that I don't trade options a lot. There's a very simple reason for it, which is that I think you pay too much for volatility. You pay too much away to the traders and to the exchanges that are professionals. An option is a levered bet. And if you're right directionally, it can pay off in an extreme way. And if you look at Elon Musk's compensation, effectively 100% of his compensation is tied up in options. So there's a huge amount of leverage embedded inside of options if you can get them at a good price and things move your way. But the risk is 100% to the downside if you end up losing all of your premium because your options didn't end up trading in the money. And I'm assuming a lot of people understand how options work already, but just for those who have never looked at one, um, an option is simply an agreement whereby the purchaser of that option has the right to buy shares at a specified price from the seller of that option at any point between the time when the trade is made and when the option expires. And by the way, options trade in lots of 100 shares. All option is indicated as a C. That's the minimum amount. The other quick thing to note is that for American style options, the option can be exercised again at any time between the trade and when the contract expires. So let me just give you a little bit behind my theory as to why I don't really trade them and why you overpay, in my opinion, for volatility. And it basically has to do with this. So CBOE.com, I'll leave a link in the description, has an option pricing tool. You can see you can set the style to American or European. I have it at European. This is a call option for the S&P index expiring roughly one month from now. Um, and so that you can see there's 32 days to, till expiration. And here's the point is when I think of an option, what I'm looking at are the variables. And so the variables are the price of the underlying index. So what you're purchasing an option on, the strike price. So in our earlier example, that would be $20. The expiration date, the implied days to expiration, the interest rate and the dividend yield don't actually matter too much. And the last thing is implied volatility or actually volatility. And so if you break an option down into knowns and unknowns, really the only thing that's not known here is the volatility. And what this represents is the amount in percentage terms that the stock is expected to move over one year. This is represented by the VIX. So I have 10 and a half typed in here and it implies a call option value of 57 per share. We can check that and see if we're actually right. So 3330, uh, the options closed at 56. So yeah, this is pretty close. You can see that the VIX is around 12 right now. What the VIX is mainly primarily telling you is what you already know. And the VIX is comprised of call and put options on the S&P, taking their implied volatility and sort of averaging them together to get one combined version 
of implied volatility. Which is the market has been exceedingly calm. So let's say I bought a stock for six days, a any stock, it doesn't matter. And this was the return profile. It was up 50 bit basis points, then up 25 basis points. It actually is pretty good. So in order to calculate the annualized volatility, you take the standard deviation of those daily returns, which is, oh, excuse me, which is right here. And the standard deviation, we probably shouldn't get too far into the math and I'll leave some other links, but the standard deviation is the square root of the variance of these returns. So basically you take the mean of the returns and then for each individual number, you subtract the mean and square the result. The reason why you square the result is to negate the effect from any negative days, negative results. So you can just see in this little sample here that our standard deviation is 0.99% or just under 1%. And the VIX equates to 16 times the daily volatility. Maybe you've heard people talk about that. A 1% daily volatility translates into a VIX of roughly 16. The reason for that, and without making it more complicated than it has to be, is because you take the daily standard deviation and annualize it by multiplying times the square root of the number of trading days in the year, which is 252. So in any event, the important thing to know is that when you annualize daily volatility, you wind up with 16 times the daily volatility, and that's that 15.7. So this is AMD, and AMD has their earnings coming up on Jan 27th, 2020, so in seven days. And let's take a look at the call options for AMD. So the stock's at 51. Let's take a look at the $51 calls, uh, which expire the 24th, which is three days before they report earnings. The implied volatility is 33. And if somebody wanted to play AMD for earnings through call options, then obviously they would have to purchase a call which expired after earnings so they could take advantage of whatever move that they were expecting. Let's see how the market prices that. So let's now go to the next expiry after that 27th. And we see that for the 51 strike price, the volatility has basically doubled all the way up to 64. So the options that expire on the 31st cost 250 and the options that expire on the 24th are 90 cents. And you can see that of course, time affects that and it affects it to a material extent, but the other huge factor is volatility. So why is this? It's basically because the professionals know that there are volatile events, particularly around earnings, and they will price the options accordingly to take account for those effects. So here's something that's interesting. I went and I looked at AMD going into last quarter. So last quarter, they reported on October 29th, 2019, after the market close. So the first day of the stock reaction would have been the 30th. And you can see that for the 30 days leading into earnings, their annualized vol was 30, which if you remember back to here is roughly where the stock is priced. It's around implied vols around 30, 31, 32. So that seems reasonable based on the trading history. And the day that the stock reacted to earnings, it was only up 30 basis points. So not a very volatile reaction at all. And I'm guessing that people who held very short term calls purely for this event lost money on volatility collapsing. Now, remember I said earlier that because options do represent a levered bet, that if you're directionally right, you can make a lot of money. Well, here's one interesting thing. The stock basically went up 18 and percent in the month following earnings but also on annualized volatility of about 30 or 31. So paying up for volatility, particularly around earnings, to me is not always a good idea. But again, it can be if you're confident in the direction of a stock. It's a way to get leverage. And one easy thing that you can do is just go back to the CBOE options calculator and enter in your price, your strike, where you want to buy it, and the date. And enter in the volatility that you have to pay. So basically whatever volatility implies the given option price, and then see what happens to the option price if you collapse the volatility to the stock's historical trading range and see how much you would lose. And to me, that's a rough indication of what you can expect to lose if you're wrong on the event and the options begin to remove that pricing in 
of a, of a volatile spike. I know that was a lot, but even if you're not following along exactly, the point is, is that options in some cases can be more expensive or pretty much in every case can be more expensive than just owning the stock outright. And also don't forget, if you buy a stock for a hundred and six months later, it's still a hundred, you haven't lost any money. But if you buy a three month call and the stock's still at the same place and the stock hasn't moved through your strike price, then you've lost a hundred percent of your premium. Let's talk about Delta really quick and simply explained, Delta represents the change in option price for every $1 move in the underlying price. And by underlying, I mean whatever security the option references. So calls always skew positive and puts always skew negative. And let's just take a look and see if our options pricer agrees with us. And yes, it does. You can see here that Delta is positive for the calls and negative for the puts. So knowing the delta can be useful for things like hedging because it basically shows you what the reaction of your option is going to be. So to even simplify a little bit further, let's say you had a call at $1 and the price of the underlying was 100 and it expired tomorrow. So roughly speaking, your call should be worth about $99, right? Because you have the right to purchase the stock for $1 and it's trading at 100, the option expires tomorrow, it probably won't move a lot, it's worth about 100. Well, if the stock went down to say 99, then the option would probably be worth 98. And when the option moves one for one with the price of the underlying, that's when you have a delta of one. And let's just see if that proves out. So right now, our price and our strike price are right on top of each other. They're basically at the money. But let's see what happens if we do what I just said. We basically move the strike down to $1. This delta is going to go up to approaching 1. In fact, it is 1. So hopefully that makes sense. I do think it is important. And honestly, I just find it sort of interesting. Uh, the same thing works the other way. So if you could imagine, let's say you had the ability to buy a stock for 100, but it was trading at one. Well, that wouldn't really be worth a lot, right? And if the stock went to 50 cents, it still wouldn't be worth a lot. That's a delta of nearly zero. So let's just say we do like, I don't know, a million something, however much that is. And Again, the price of the index is here at 33.29. We have a call option to buy the stock at a billion or the index at a billion or something like that. That's not going to be worth very much. So delta should be close to zero. Okay, yeah, and in fact it is zero. Let me do something a little bit more normal so you can just see that delta will move up from zero as we get closer to the strike. Even 4,000 won't do it and that's because the S&P isn't volatile enough to get up there. At least that's what the options are saying. Let's say 3,400. Delta will still be below 0.5, but it'll be higher than zero. So it's 0.15. That's about all I have today for options. If you want to talk about options more, let me know. There's a lot to cover in this world, but again, it is not my specialty. It's not something I focus on, and that's because of the structural disadvantage that we have as investors when we pay too much for volatility. Again, it doesn't mean you can't make money with options. Some of the wealthiest people on the planet have made money with options, but they've done them in concentrated situations in many instances with stock options and not necessarily purchasing options on the open market. So, let me know. Do you agree with this philosophy? Do you trade options? What do you think about trading options around the quarters? I'd love to hear your thoughts. As I said, this is just my opinion. Thanks again. I hope you'll consider subscribing and I'll see you soon. It's been a lot of fun.